Welcome to the Dividend Talk Podcast, episode 159. Macro numbers we follow and a few additional earnings. Whether you're a seasoned pro or just getting started, Dividend Talk is the place to be for insights, analysis, and unsalted advice on how to make the most of your money through dividends with our own unique European flavor. Oh, and don't forget to subscribe to our podcast and join our community on Facebook at Dividend Talk. See you on the inside. Hey, European DJ. How are you, buddy? Oh, really good. It's, uh, what is it today? The 11th of August already. The year goes so fast, you know. Did you, do you know that in a, in, a, in a little bit we're talking about Q3 numbers uh, already in a few weeks and then we start thinking about already about, you know, Christmas and everything. I mean, it's 11 August. Probably people are listening to this on vacation. But to me, when I see this and I, I think about the math of it, it's like, okay, Eight divided by twelve, and uh, you know it's closer to the end than to the beginning. It's crazy when you think about it. <laughs> yeah, a little bit too soon for me to think about Christmas, but you're the second person that has said that to me this week. Believe it or not, it's oh, <laughs> there. it must be on a lot of people's minds. But yeah, it's crazy how fast this this year is after going and the summer as well. It's 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 feel like the summer has has come and gone in in the blink of an eye. The kids will be back in school soon, so. And, and then they say that dividend investing is for the long term, but long term goes really quick, I can tell you. Yeah, yeah. It feels, it feels like a short term at the moment. <laughs> yeah. Well, hey, we have a show today, which is a little bit different, I think, from what we usually talk about. Um, we're going to look at some of the macro numbers. We know we get like questions about this quite a bit. What kind of macro trends do we follow? Does it influence our decisions? So we might just have a little chat and see what we do follow, what we don't follow, and, and our thoughts around that. But before that, we have a couple of earnings that we'd like to share with everyone. And the first one is one of our favorites, I must say, is Ahol Delhazy. And I know you dug into this one, so give us your Yeah, thoughts. for me, Ahol Delhazy is always one of those earnings that I um, really look forward to. I was listening live also to the earnings call, and it was really interesting. So generally speaking, if you think about the company was doing so-so, I was not really impressed with these quarters uh, numbers. Uh, America did, as usual, okay. Uh, Europe actually had quite some sales increase, so they were able to pass on more prices to the better prices to the to the consumer. Um, margins just were really on the low end here, so profit-wise, still, I think America's performing better. Um, what I also liked in the comments of the CEO is that um, customers are, some customers are becoming really more price sensitive, so they are buying more of their in-house products, right? They, they are, they are, they are, do you call this white label in English? And um, But they think this will stay, this is there to stay, and which is good because it's a relatively high margin uh, product line. And they are generally also winning prices uh, based on their quality that they have. So I think it's generally good if they if they can sell more of this. But of course, the the big thing there was, <laughs> and this was like the whole earnings call. And the question was asked like nine or ten times to the CEO. And I think the CEO really regrets, really regrets how they've presented it, because effectively what happened is they had a tax windfall of 300 something million from the belgium government and they raised their guidance to 2.2 billion from 2 billion to 2.2 billion so all the analysts are having their excel sheets open and they want to know okay like this 2.2 billion should i model based on this going forward and therefore increase my uh, uh, fair value or is this the tax windfall uh, included here and actually if I do 2.2 minus uh, 300 something, actually we have a downgrade uh, in the worst case even. So this was effectively almost a whole earnings call about it. And the, the CEO, Franz Muller, was not able to get away with it easily. I, I found him speaking with a lot of conviction in general. When you listen to Franz Muller, you really hear such a Dutch guy that knows what, what he's talking about. 
But this one, I think, uh, he was not able to explain it. He was mentioning, like, yeah, there was already something in it in the, in the earlier guidance and, 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 and this and that. But he wasn't able to tell us, okay, you know what, guys? In the former guidance of 2 billion, we had, I don't know, 200 million tax windfall in it. It became 360. So from 2 to 2.2, it's uh, 160 million additional. And the other 40 million is organically. Yeah, he was not able to tell us to that. So, and that's I think also why you saw the price tanking uh, on that day with three, four percent. And I think, uh, yeah, analysts in general were not too happy with with that kind of lack of clarity. While he had to four times repeat himself, like, "Oh, uh, apologies for if, if if I wasn't clear, but let me let me try to explain it once again." Next one, apologies if I wasn't totally clear. It seems to based on your questions. Let me try to explain it a little bit from this angle, and yeah. and this call just kept on going like this. So. Yeah, but wh why why try to hide it? I mean, he's got clever guys on on that call who know where that money has come from. Why not just? Just... I think he was totally caught off off guard with this one. Uh, I think that because if you look at the slides, not in the earnings release, but if you look at the slide, it was straight away a really nice free cash flow uh, delta compared to last year. Yeah, so not compared to their guidance. So that's what people were looking for. Really nice. So I think they really did their best to inform shareholders. But I think they were probably thinking like, okay, this is it. They can work with this, and they haven't thought like a shareholder or an analyst when preparing this information. I think that's where they make a mistake. I really give him the benefit of the doubt because generally speaking, it's a solid, uh, no-nonsense CEO. So I think he just uh, wasn't totally prepared, wasn't at all prepared for it and probably didn't have the numbers at the hand or just didn't even think about how an analyst uh, could look at this like that. But guys, this is a lot about the free cash flow. It's just for me, it's entertainment, right? I, I, I listened to this. It's a bit too early for popcorn on the day, but uh, with a nice coffee, my earplugs in, and uh, I'm, I'm just enjoying it. Uh, but the biggest news, of course, was the interim dividend that was announced for of 49 cents. It's, I think, 40% of the, um, uh, based on 40% of the earnings from last year. That's typically how many European companies do their interim dividends, right? It's a certain percentage. And yeah. I think in some, in some countries, I read it once, I just can't find it back. It's even an, uh, an obligation, I believe, that you that you are kept. But I don't know which country it was, maybe Germany. But uh, yeah, it's a small hike of uh, 7% uh, compared to last year. But you need to know three or four years ago, they paid a 50 cents interim dividend i think it was during COVID uh, uh, or something like that so all in all i would say actually good numbers yeah just good numbers it was just like a lot of um, a noise around this free cash flow and if you think about it, if you just really keep it simple right my fair value is around 26 and uh, and, and some change and it's trading at 31 euro but if you if you're a true dividend growth investor, you can look actually a little bit easier. Look, you get this company for a three and a half percent yield. It has a five year dividend growth track record of eleven percent. Clearly, it's a chowder number. I don't think it will grow with eight, uh, twelve percent going forward. Maybe with seven or eight on on average. So you get like almost a chowder of twelve. Let's say eleven. Uh, it has a payout ratio of less than fifty. Yeah. The the price to earnings is around 12 yeah um so what are we talking about here yeah if you don't own a hold yet and you want a decent yield three and a half percent plus plus enough room to grow a safe dividend it's it's just really nicely valued i would say yeah yeah i, I, I wouldn't i wouldn't be so eager to say that this is overvalued and i think you've explained it quite nicely <laughs> the different catalysts uh, that they have and the different metrics they have so i mean you're, you're fighting over change here really if you're you're waiting for it to come down um but yeah personally if i didn't have any air hold i would i would be straight in at, at 30. no 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 fear of that yeah exactly so did this for me i hold this is the company where you really have passion uh uh behind it so it was nice to to read up again and it's just the quarterly earnings of course yeah. but um yeah another big one like uh, like like really like uh, i say the big gorilla of course in the insurance industry was allianz Ooh. and remember like uh, two years ago when they had this kind of pension fund retirement fund or retirement money that they uh lost uh for the teachers or something like that in america yeah well uh, I think they have that a little bit behind them. And, and what I really liked, and I looked into the numbers again, 
um, simply said is the property and casualty business and uh, the life health uh, insurance business line uh, and that, that's what people need to know this is really where they earn their money yeah and these these businesses have been on fire uh, from that point of view and i'm talking on fire not like uh, like a growth stock uh, like uh, palantir i'm talking here about a slow growing company they were able to grow their um i said their income their revenue and, and, and such um about eight and six percent and then the uh, i said the net income even uh, around 33 percent based on um, uh, on this or 22 percent sorry 22 percent so that's really where they earn their money and if you then look at the asset management division it what is it uh, it is like 700 million compared to the other two business units that are bringing in 3.1 billion uh, uh, combined so I think the asset management business is not something that really worries me so much anymore uh, in the, because after the teacher scandal I feel like whoa we have a big liability here but actually it's so it's okay and and what I really like about right their six month uh, earnings per share is 11 euro and 40 cents guess what the annual dividend is 11 euro and 40 cents so <laughs> the next six months they are just earning uh safety for us dividend safety for us and that's what i love about this right that they have already like earned the dividend for us for next year effectively so pretty much a safe dividend in my opinion you can get it for a 5.2 percent yield here also i think around a fair price uh, around 219 so again it's not uh, it's not a screaming buy but i mean if you also don't have some alliance and you want to have some alliance expect really slow growth as a company equally so in the dividend but it, it is at least a nice um uh dividend yield in this high interest environment yeah nice Nice results from, from Allianz, and it's always good to have your dividends covered nice and early to take away. Yeah, yeah exactly. Or, you want to have them covered after the first quarter already, right? <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. But how often that happens. Yeah. Nice one. Um, so I think the last company then, another gigantic European company is Siemens, released their quarter three um, earnings as well. Um, and they've had a pretty decent quarter as well. So you can see that their order numbers rose by... 15 percent which helped the revenue grow a total of 10 percent up to 24.2 billion which is quite something um they are industrial business sector is what they're most proud of um they amounted to around 2.8 billion which is slightly lower than last year um i must say but all the other industries looking at smart infrastructure digital industries they actually saw some decent growth as well, particularly the digital industries uh, where they talk a lot about AI um, in their presentation as well. Um, net income increased to 1.4 billion. They made a loss this time last year um, of around 1.5 billion. And I think that was due to the Siemens energy investment as well, um, last year's loss. So this year it's a positive number, 1.4 billion. And their cash flow is around 3 billion as well. Um, which is a 29% rise from last year. Um, so I think, look, I think overall it's been a steady, steady quarter for, for this company. I haven't checked their share price, but I know uh, it dropped been... quite a bit. Yeah. And, and yeah, and it had to do with the, the write down of another, what was it, the 2.7 billion in Siemens Energy? Um, it had to do with their uh, struggling wind turbine uh, division there. So, and you know, they own a they they need to do an impairment charge so i looked at the balance sheet and they did quite a significant impairment charge so yeah. effectively uh, you know this deteriorates shareholder value right it, it, it doesn't mean it impacts cash flow and everything um but you know if you need to write down things on the asset side uh, of the balance sheet the debt stays the same uh, what you are obliged so where does it go down on the equity part and that's our share in the company right so yeah. And then and that's what people of course don't like shareholders and they bought all that and they they set the price lower yeah yeah it makes sense I'm, I'm i'm scrolling through the presentation here and i can't find them mentioning it that in the uh, well, they, they mentioned it uh but they it, it was again not not front uh, in your face uh there so yeah good catch good catch but i think aside from that i think look it's it's pretty pretty decent they do generate 
a lot of free cash flow and it's good to see orders coming up but look we we, we spoke about siemens before it's just interesting to see how they start talking about ai now particularly in their digital industries and primarily around their data centers as well so it's um it's something that i think we're going to see more and more of in the upcoming upcoming quarters yeah so it trades now at 137 um, euro which is uh, quite interesting right um because yeah. you get it now for 3.1 percent dividend yield that they quickly calculated so it's for me again interesting and i still have a small position in siemens um i hope it goes back to 100 of course but when yeah that's always the question <laughs> yeah but maybe maybe i should nibble in one one time again it, it's i i love this company if you think about industrials it's for me probably the best industrial i like danaher also a lot but i haven't yeah. looked into it lately uh, anymore yeah yeah me too uh down by 100 it dipped under 100 if i remember um it was a nice price yeah. to buy but yeah interesting interesting company all all together and probably coming into a good value as well yeah so good. let's go to the main topic of today because i i really want to get this off my chest right we often get also on twitter and 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 and, and, and such especially on twitter i would say often we see on our timeline a lot about macro and there are these big twitter accounts that i have a feeling are all the time fear-mongering and 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 those and those accounts grow on this right uh, where they were a year maybe ago maybe uh, twenty thousand followers now they have hundred thousand followers yeah and all the time in capital letters they're saying stuff about whoa uh, Powell this or Yellen this or that and GDP. Oh, people are 4.2% uh, uh, unemployment rate versus 4.1. The world is going down, you know. So I really felt like we need to dedicate at least one time some time to this topic so that we can discuss it and never need to touch it again. Uh, <laughs> that was my thinking. Of course, I may be an optimist here, but yeah. So Yeah, yeah. Yeah, look, it's it's something that we always get questions on. I, I think it's it's quite interesting. You you hit a lot of points there already in your your little opening speech there. But I I, I try and stay away from the likes of Twitter and and Facebook and any even even news outlets. So when it comes to macros, it's always worst case scenario. Always worst case scenario, and it's very easy to get your head in the spin, go down a rabbit hole. And if you were to sit there and look at every single trend, you would probably not buy anything because yeah. GDP is high today. Interest rates were high last week. Inflation is high this week. Um, we had a dollar that was weak, a dollar that was strong. Um, so it's it's easy to go down that that rabbit hole. But let's be honest, there must be one or two that you are looking at. If oh, not okay. now, if not okay, now. Before you go before. there, because you touched a really nice point. I was sitting with my wife on the couch. Doesn't happen too often. Uh, but I was sitting with her on the couch and watching the news. I think I watched the news for the first time seriously in a year. And I was making a joke to my wife, like, no wonder that depressions are at a uh, skyrocketing level. Because I saw flooding in Slovenia. I saw forest fires in Portugal in the uh, or in Spain, uh, wherever it was. Um, there was other uh, high water uh, in some of the countries here after the rainfall. Uh, there was a storm. There was a tornado somewhere in the U.S. Uh, there was somewhere a pedophile, uh, and the whole village was uh, scared. So when you when you, when you think about it, I felt like is there nothing happy uh, happy? on the news like nothing at all like nothing because when you watch the news i felt like damn this is like where's will smith yeah <laughs> we need him independence day uh it's happening you know the world is exploding and it's the same that's exactly the same kind of analogy now with the with, with what you were mentioning right so you you really reminded me about that uh and and there's also uh, from one th one thing that you mentioned there i learned over time to turn off the noise and one thing that I benefit from, I don't live anymore in the country of my origin. So there's a language barrier here. So actually, when I started living here, I really enjoyed it that I couldn't understand a thing effectively. And I enjoyed so much the peace that I kind of made it a habit to not anymore go into it uh, there. Anyway, but if you think about um, macro, I, I want to share a little bit of the story because I wasn't like that. Um, I, I mentioned several times on the podcast here that I've been under investing uh, between uh, until 2019. 
yeah, I was all the time waiting for a crash to happen. So instead of um, uh, putting my monthly contribution into the market, I was, let's say, doing half here, half there. I was a bit afraid to, you know, uh, the Greek debt, debt crisis what was at the time. Uh, I already felt like, how, how come the countries can print so much money without any impact? Yeah, that doesn't make sense. It still doesn't make sense to me. But between 2014 and 2019, five years long, I've been under investing. I've been saving up, but I didn't buy benefit from buying Johnson Johnson at eighty dollars. Can you imagine eighty dollars yeah. from where it is now? Yeah, all the time thinking like, ah, oh, you know, the market is so expensive. The market is so expensive, and and I want people to know this because if you're a beginning investor you're used to to going a certain websites like yahoo finance or something like that and it's full in your face continuously yeah full in your face and when you go on social media it's also full in your face it's really really hard to not get afraid or to 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 have such a thick skin that that you don't get influenced by it and then you go to seeking alpha and people are also saying like oh the world is going down uh, start hedging your portfolio and you're stupid if you don't buy options and hedge your portfolio i was doing that in 2016 2017 i was putting out of my three percent dividend yield i was putting one percent in in put options to hedge my portfolio on, on on things that i never needed this insurance so and if i would have continued doing that over the last 10 years it would have cost me a fortune yeah for this one time that i might uh, get a 30 percent crash or something like that that will be a little bit longer there so i really had to change my perspective uh, on that one i think it's important to share that that um it had it didn't help me it only costed me money it only cost me money yeah it, it made me think of the story around mike the dividend guy who took a huge chance he writes about this he talks about this but it was a 2018 yeah. and he took he took out his money and when everybody was saying the market's going to crash he pumped every single thing he had in into the stock market and he's done pretty pretty well out of it so it's it's always worth i think horning off the noise and staying but it's hard it's like you have to say put yourself in as a as a new investor where do you go you go online looking for inspiration looking for resources looking to educate yourself so it's only natural you're going to come across these websites and considering you are new how can you but not be affected by this because you don't uh, you, uh, no you don't you need to anything. gain the experience you need to gain the experience and lots of learnings um there's no other way there's no other way or listen to dividend talk yeah yeah we'll, we'll yeah. tell you but but if if you were to pick if you were to pick two or three that would affect you or has the potential to maybe yeah. alter the way you think which ones right now would you most yeah most influential so, decisions so what let's bring it back to how i'm investing right so i do look at valuation and i know that valuation are heavily influenced by interest rates and also by in in uh, I said other yield alternatives like bonds or, or whatever it is. So one of the things that I usually look at, it doesn't really influence my decision, but kind of gives me a feeling like are certain companies that I'm going to buy maybe more subject to, to price depreciation or, or cap. And, and that's then the S&P 500 earnings yield. So how do you calculate that? The current PE, you can just look it up of the S&P 500. Is some, I just looked up before the show, is around 25 price to earnings for all the 500 companies combined, which gives you an earnings yield of 4%. The 10-year treasury yield is currently at 4.2%. So what this tells me is that the 10 years treasury yield is, is, is you know, a 10-year bond provided by the United States which is considered one of the safest in the world, even after the downgrade we had. So you can get almost like a risk-free return of 4.2% versus a 4% uh, return on the S&P 500, where you got lots of risk, right? Because of all the companies. Yeah. So this is the only thing I uh, usually look a little bit at, if, if anything, from the macro numbers, because it gives me a sense of where we are in the cycle uh and what we can expect um just from stocks in general yeah because 
naturally you would argue if this happens you will see that more people will start buying bonds again so the money will flow out of the stock market more into the bond market financial advisors will probably say like oh finally it is the time that you can go for this 40 60 uh, ratio or something like that because it makes a bit sense again um so yeah but but honestly in the end this is also what i uh wanted to mention i can't do really a lot with this information so i can look at a little bit like okay you know probably real estate investment trust will be lower for longer yeah so is this then the moment to go heavily into it or not i think we will still have a lot of time because of kind of this data point uh, that i look at um but what really changed me uh, is when i was reading uh, one of buffett's um, letters and he and and you hear me this also more often saying when we get questions that it's not the stock market but the market of stocks and when that light bulb went on i thought like oh wait a second from the several thousands of stocks no matter in what cycle we are there's always something there that i can find to invest in and it has been proven proven right whether the market was really expensive at the top in 2021 or 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 now when it's uh, the ai hype is again now we are benefiting from insurance stocks yeah that was uh clearly like the first half year heavily beaten down as example real estate investment trust as well in 2021 we were buying several consumer staples right because they were out of favor because everyone needed to, to have the next uh, the next what was it the growth stock yeah so for me um realizing this effectively it, it put all macro stuff also aside and there are quite some macro numbers out there because you can look at gdp yeah and and for people that maybe don't know what uh, gdp is in in layman's term um, just imagine that you have a big big pie that represents all the goods and services produced in the country right this is what we're talking here and the size of that pie and if the size of the pie is growing year over year we're, we're saying that the economy or uh, such is producing more you can measure it typically in two ways like how much money is made by people and companies that are offering those products and services or how much money is spent and that that's effectively what the gdp number uh means and a growing gdp is what countries want to see because then you know it creates more wealth for the country for the citizens and for the companies and also they can leverage more up because they can pay for the few they can already take some payments forward from the future that's what politicians like as well yeah so you know you, you have then um, gdp you have uh, unemployment rates interest rates consumer confidence business confidence debt to gdp uh, the china u.s trade deficit population growth decline you name it yeah and this sells a lot this information and i've been able to turn it all off and i can tell you it's really peaceful in my mind yeah yeah i, I was just listening to you talking there and, and like my first thought is you're talking about gdp as a dividend growth investor how does that affect me like re realistically how how does that affect me like gdp is is usually within a country so america will have one or ireland will have one poland will have one but our companies are multinationals <laughs> so yeah so they're, they're not just based in one region either so yeah. if, if if one part of the world is not producing as much if their goods and services are starting to slow down then another part of the world is probably starting to boom as well yeah and if not then we're all screwed so yeah, so, yeah. I, I i don't i don't know how 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 something like that would would affect me as a dividend growth investor but some of the things that generally that would make me think a little bit more is is inflation that we've had um or that we have um sometimes currency exchange rates but not so much i think we spoke about it on the show it does even itself out over time but it can influence whether i if I had a 50 50 chance of buying European or US, and depending on how the dollar is performing, you, you could go to US. Um, some tax policies and regulatory uh, changes, particularly in, say, utilities and, and rates, they're probably the only four yeah. I would consider. Um, are, the, are those mic macro? Uh, they, they, those are external influences, right? Yeah. That, they can influence an industry and be kind of depress the industry for a longer time right yeah probably 
they're probably a cause of macros yeah. of, of certain situations. Yeah. They're 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 an effect. They're they're not they're not yeah the main things like so inf- inflation is probably yeah. the only one there that you could say is is macro related. Yeah. Yeah, no, the, so GDP in, in, to some extent it matters because, for instance, why am I investing in US and in some some European countries? Because I believe that those countries where those companies earn their money will generally do better ten years from now compared to where they are today. So there are companies that we have blue chip companies that, that they're they're mature. The the um, like even a new business line doesn't give a lot of incremental revenue. So those companies' revenues are typically growing around inflation rates. But you really need GDP to grow for those uh, companies for them to continue growing er- uh, revenue and therefore earnings and dividends. So it does matter, but it doesn't matter on a day-to-day ba- basis when you're watching CNBC or any other thing. This matters for me on a ten-year basis. Like, can America have a larger GDP in ten years from now than where they are today? Yeah, I believe so, and I also believe that for the Netherlands. I even believe that for France, yeah, that they <laughs> that they can have that because striking is already uh, is already uh, how you said priced in there. So, yeah, and, and and so, but it's not something on a day-to-day basis. Um, uh, that I look at, and how what how does inflation matter to you, if I may ask? So, uh, inflation for me matters because pretty much it erodes the purchasing power of all future cash flows, and that could obviously affect your dividend, um, and also your valuation. We we value companies based on based on a discounted cash flow model, and you make an assumption maybe two percent, three percent a year inflation in that. But if we're in if we're in a high interest a high inflationary environment for a longer period, those models go out the window. <laughs> and you're but, uh, but uh, do you mean inflation or interest? Because usually we use interest rates in DCF and inflation can trigger higher interest like we have seen, right? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Pretty much, yeah. 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 <laughs> full in the face seventeen uh, percent last year uh, inflation and the interest rates uh, for my mortgage are now around eight percent. So yeah. But like one of the things I would look for, particularly with companies, is can and I've been looking at it when I read through the reports is can they actually pass on them costs to the consumers? Because we've seen that in some yes. companies, some companies yes. are struggling quite a bit to actually pass on those costs, and then what happens? They have to eat into their cash flow and sometimes actually take out yeah. debt to to finance that. So it it would technically influence some of my investment decisions. Yeah, and those are especially companies with brands strongly in the b2c like albertine with from alta has a, yeah they get a lot of scrutiny in the press yeah uh, but if you're in the b2b like microsoft yeah it's uh, a different different level yeah total different story right yeah yeah so so honestly derek this is all that i can talk about macro uh, it's it's more than enough sometimes on twitter i like to uh, uh tease a little bit those big accounts but but other than that, I can't I can't lie awake from it. Really not. Yeah, I, if, I have no influence, by the way, on it. Yeah, and if if I would if it would influence my dividend growth investment strategy, we're starting to talk here about timing the market more, because that's maybe where it's interesting. On the short term, you can time maybe the market a little bit with that. Uh, but even so, if I look at all these uh, pundits that have been saying that there is a recession coming and and everything, I mean. It's it's the most predicted recession, and it still hasn't happened. Yeah, yeah. I, I, look, I, I mean, if I was to give one piece of advice, it's probably just focus on financials, but focus on the balance sheet. If if yeah. there's if there's going to be a period of turbulence that that you're worried about, companies with strong balance sheets usually do well in the long term. Exactly. Exactly. Okay, um, we've got quite some questions to get through, so we might. Um, might start on them. Um, the first one is from Dennis. And he says, foreign investor whose snowball is still needs to really start rolling. Do you differentiate between quarterly dividend paying companies and half yearly paying companies? Um, no, not really. I'm now 10 years down the road. I don't really look at it. 
Um, I have some months that pay me more dividends than other uh, months, like May, as an example, because of my European holdings. But I get the question, right? Uh, ideally, you want to have the money as quick as possible, not waiting a whole year from it, so that you can um, benefit more from dividend reinvestment. So, yes, that could give you a half percent gain in the long run or maybe a percent. But um, I, I just want to own good businesses. And, yeah, it so happens to be that they pay in a certain uh, uh, cadence and a certain month. But I must say, like, over time, like, you see that when you all the time are curious about new companies, that you kind of spread it a bit out automatically and then you get still kind of every month every quarter a similar amount of money except for quarter two then is a little bit more because of um, the european stocks yeah it's something i i thought about before and and i get it particularly in the beginning you want you just want to see those dividend checks coming into your account yeah. as quickly as possible and probably more frequently and it's it's probably one of the reasons why some of the monthly paying companies are popular as well yeah, so I, I love them as well. Yeah. yeah, I mean, everybody likes to see that. But the only thing I would say is that if if you're in that thought process as, like I am, you're probably going to sacrifice quality just to chase that extra dividend yeah. check frequency. Yeah. Um, so I forget about that. Like if you're getting a 3% yield, it doesn't matter if you're getting it every quarter or every year or, or every half year. The money is going to still be the same. Um, yeah. So just focus on business quality. And, and as you said, over time, you will naturally own companies that will pay all different all different yes. timeframes. So. Um, Patrick has asked us personal question: How do you stay fit so you can enjoy living for dividends for a long time? I go to the gym three days, three or three or four days a week, and I've just started back playing football as well. Um, yeah. I'm, going, I'm going back to the over thirty fives. They call it over here. It's the it's where all the old people go to play football who still think they're Ronaldo. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I do the same. I play football. I've got two kids. Uh, look, Patrick, it, it's hard to fight. I mean, I have a desk job. I feel like a Geppetto. I, I don't have flexibility. Yeah, that's my issue. I, I do stretching and such. And But, you know, for me, stretching is so boring. When I'm stretching for 10 minutes and I need to do this via a YouTube lady that is saying what to do, <laughs> in my panties yeah then after 10 minutes i have already thought about five stocks that i want to look up and i'm wondering like oh wh what was again in their balance sheet yeah so i don't have the patience to just sit and, and do the stretching so i think i just need to get really filthy rich so that i get a massage person that can just massage me all the time so that i get the flex because but other than that it's sporting yeah yeah, yeah. You need to um you need to do what most of our community do and just pick a podcast and go running <laughs> <My dad. laughs> but i think patrick is the runner right uh, yeah, he's, yeah. He's, he's one of those runners yeah, yeah. yeah there's, there's a couple there's a couple of them there um jeremy has asked us how do you stay motivated during the boring middle of dividend investing journey yeah I, I know what he means it is uh to some extent boring because you know uh, simply how it looks like the first two three years everything is new you're learning you're reading books you're making mistakes you're getting better a certain moment like for me now after nine years yeah it is boring but i would say jeremy start a podcast i know he started blogging uh, share your knowledge and that makes it quite exciting and and for the rest yeah no boring may, maybe means also that he's really experienced right now and that he gets actually time to do other stuff yeah i i, I have no other <laughs> suggestion <laughs> yeah i mean it's it's supposed to be boring isn't it that's why we're yeah that's why exactly. we're, the, we're the tortoise we're not um we're not the hair here so we, we take it nice and slow it's meant to be boring when it gets exciting it means there's something happening in the market that probably we don't want to happen so exactly exactly keep it, keep it boring um christian has asked us are you using a benchmark to compare your annual return including dividend if yes which one no i don't the only benchmark i have is against my goal of dividend growth and that's it uh, me too i don't use the benchmark either um chris it's not really a question um but i will read it out anyway i think he's just sharing a part of his journey 
Um, he uses two different compound interest formulas in Excel. It calculates how much projected dividends he will have at the age of 65. What he finds interesting is that the change in yield up or down doesn't really move the needle from. It's the five-year average growth percentage that really moves it. Right now, he's at a 4% yield and a weighted five-year dividend growth rate of 5%. So he's targeting only buying stocks that he already owns that beats those numbers. And he's going down the path of really owning a PTF, uh, an ETF, because um, he wants to own in around 200 different stocks, 20% foreign, 80% local. Um, yeah, so it's quite a quite an interesting strategy, that isn't it? Yeah, and it's something that uh, Alan uh, that uh, that wrote a blog post uh, on on my uh, blog also was talking about. I, th I think it's a nice one. That's the, that's the thing, right? Uh, you can actually, although it's really boring dividend growth investing, you can have so such a diversity in strategies here, and I think it's it's nice. What Chris effectively is building is one of the the biggest money machines in the world and 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 that's nice and daily dividends probably yeah at, at, at that level you don't have to dig into fundamentals as much because you're not nah. going to you're, you're one one company is not going to hugely dent your your you, you, i think you just look at the starting yield plus uh, payout ratio for both free cash flow and eps and yeah that's probably it and just and just load up so interesting and and it's good that he has a 20 year plan so it makes your nine years exactly nearly middle of, of the 20 <laughs> years but it's yeah. it's it's good to have that sort of plan and um interesting he's also said that um he's got a huge spreadsheet um so he's obviously good with numbers good with excel sheets but nice nice one um, La Collector de Dividendes has asked us, after how many years of dividend investing would you say it becomes material impactful in terms of expense coverage ratio? Uh, it's a difficult question to answer because it depends a lot on your savings rate and such. So it depends on how much dividends you need to need to have as well. But for instance, for me, the impact came um, when it was a few thousand uh, euro per year. Um, why impactful? Because suddenly you can just go on vacation and knowing that your entire vacation was paid by dividends and then still you have dividends left to pay for your bills and everything. So I, I would say once your dividend income on an annual basis is going above thousand, for me, that was already really impactful because when i started working in 2005 i was able to save with a little bit of luck 100 euro per month so i was talking about 1200 and i had to save the whole year for that so when you then suddenly get 1200 in uh, in dividends on an annual basis that was quite a emotional moment for me knowing that like whoa look at what these companies are giving me already right uh, in, in in profits towards me yeah so yeah Nice one. Um, Jan Racker has asked us, vacation is about traveling and visiting new countries. Have you ever found some new product services that made you research the company and then invest in them? Yeah, I think Tule. Tule is a great example. Yeah, you see their um, uh, their their car boxes and, and, and everything on the campsites and everything. So everyone who goes for camping and wants to show off a little bit not not show off but also just have high quality you buy tule yeah it it, it is like the iphone of, um, of 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 such kind of gear and yeah so i definitely looked into it this year i was in italy i saw a lot of anel and i wasn't too impressed with the state of what i saw so it made me look it up as well and i felt like okay now you know now i know for sure i will never invest in it so yeah, yeah, no, definitely. No, no how like, about you? I, I can't, I can't think of one off the top of my head. Um, usually places we go on vacation or I'm going to work. Uh, it's probably Italy, America, Spain, but you come across places I already know and, and and that. So yeah, I can't, I can't think. Um, Aaron has asked us. I would like to know how you guys handle diversification. What categories and percentages are do you care? Yes, so Aaron, I've got a blog post about it on my blog. You will e you'll be a easily 
you can easily find it. It's it's about dividend allocation strategy. And effectively, I don't want my core stocks, so the 10 core stocks that I really want to own and build my portfolio around, not to be more than 4%. And sector-wise, I've got some sector limits, so let's say maximum 20% per, uh, for the biggest sector, something like that. And yeah, that's why I have around 40 to 50 stocks, yeah, so that if one stock would go bust entirely, I would lose four or five percent and the other rest of the portfolio will hopefully with their seven percent annualized growth cover the 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 loss yeah really really simple it's, it's i guess it it's not like how diversification theory teaches us in the books for me it's just like more like uh, yeah thinking about my risk tolerance yeah i, rem I remember in the first part of my journey really worrying about diversification it was almost like that I had to do it on a month by month basis nearly just to try and balance out all my different sectors and allocations. But then you're missing out on some really good opportunities. I probably yeah. bought a lot more shell at the time, actually, um, thinking about it. So now I, I realize I'm in the accumulation phase. There's going to be times when I'm over, when I'm under, um, and I'm not too worried about it. I'll probably worry a little bit more when I get to a level where the dividends can sustain my income and I want to yes. potentially live off them. That's when I'll give it a little bit more thought. Um, but until that time, I'm just going to keep buying what I see is cheap. But I have the same, yeah, in the, because we're in the accumulation phase. Let's face it, the first stock you buy, you're 100% into one stock. Yeah, you buy a second stock, it's 50%. And this is how it will go. Yes, suddenly when Shell was so cheap, it, it, it became 12% of my portfolio. I started buying other stocks since then. It's now like 7% of my portfolio. So it, it lowers because of buying other stuff. And yeah, you're entirely spot on there. Yeah. Um, Adrian has asked us, what is a practical, easy approach to assessing dividend safety for your current positions as time passes? Um, so first of all, look at the, I said, so if you really want to take it easy, I would say check the, um, I said the credit rating of the company, it tells you something about the financial health of the company, but honestly, it's a bit what we, what I mentioned earlier. One, do you think that the, um, I said the company will be better off 10 years from now than where it is today? Good. That means it has a uh, growth potential. Two is the is the payout ratio, let's say around sixty percent uh, or lower. And uh, three, yeah, what does the credit rating tell you? If you don't want to look into financial statements, I think if you look at those three easy ones, then you know that you have a company that's probably going to grow. The dividend uh, payout ratio is relatively uh, low, and it has a healthy balance sheet. Nice, nice and easy. Um, DG Investing has asked us, hey guys, EJ, I went through your blog and in one of your annual reports, you mentioned that the organic dividend growth of your portfolio should be equal to 6% on a yearly basis. How do you calculate this organic dividend growth? Yeah, that's a bit tricky, and um, this, but I found it so important because portfolio management tools don't really do that, that you get available online, and people say, like, ah, I grow my dividend by 25% year over year, but they, of course, invest a lot of cash, and I, I do the same, right? You see in my pictures that as well when I share it. But um, um, DG Investing, what I, what I did effectively, I looked at my holdings, let's say 31 December 2022, and then I will look at those holdings only and the dividend that it was generating. And then I will calculate as uh, looking at those holdings on 31 December 2023. So I, I ignore everything I bought uh, this year. And then I look at, okay, how what, what, does, what did I get paid, let's say, throughout to 2023? And based on that, I know if my dividend has been organically growing. So everything that is new bought, I ignore in this calculation. Good. I hope that's clear. Um, Eric has asked us, what is your view on fixed dividend versus a variable di dividend that is dependent on NI? And I'm assuming NI here is net income. Net right? income. Yes, I, I don't really understand the question as such, but let me say it, uh, let me translate it like this. I assume that he's talking here about 
um, for instance, a 40% payout ratio based on earnings um, uh, dividend versus a dividend that is, um, how is it, kind of having a different growth policy. And then, of course, I like the dividend growth policy. But uh, Eric, I don't entirely get the question. Sorry. That's okay. Um, Simon has asked us, is there a stock you would label as the drunken dance your friends will never let you forget? i.e. you immediately regretted your decision purchase well i never had it after directly buying but uh, i did have it after a while and for me i think the best is tupperware yeah i i i honestly thought that germans would continue to love having tupperware parties but i think that generation is slowly dying and you could see it later back in the numbers of tupperware yeah yeah, the, the, my ones are not related to dividend growth investing, but I have two in my portfolio from, they must be in there now 18 months, but solo. Um, so they, I don't, they're like solo mechanic, a, a car on three wheels. I don't know how that's ever going to take off. It's like Dell by Trotter. <laughs> so that is tanked. And the other one is Wish. And we all know Wish, that when you buy something on Wish that looks like it's going to be huge, it comes like in miniature size um so they are there are the two i would say that are definitely the drunken dance your friends will <laughs> never let you forget nice one um, jack has asked us what made you choose a dividend growth strategy over investing in an s p index fund and um, that was easy we have something in ireland called a deemed disposal rule i absolutely hate it um which is why i never invested in index funds um, and it led me naturally down the path to dividend growth investing yeah, and for me, um, I realized that I'm not good in, in in investing in itself. I think, you know, I don't know how to time the market. I don't know when to sell a stock uh, um, based on price. So if, if it comes to share prices, yeah, I'm just bad at that. And dividend growth investing is so much easier from that point of view because, you know, of course, it takes work compared to investing in ETF, but... Yeah, you can just, you know, the selling the selling rule is simple when it cuts the dividend. Yeah, so it makes it so easy uh, these kinds of things. And secondly, I mean, seeing those dividends coming in, I mean, I mean, it's laughing for uh, on first sight for me. So, you know, and when you're in love, you 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 don't you look through pink glasses. You don't think <laughs> rationally. <laughs> love, love was it? Love is in the eye of the beholder. So yeah yeah um we got a question from the wall van blurk i don't know if i pronounced that correctly i see you <laughs> laughing um but hey guys what are your views on business development companies bdc's and um, he's given an example of horizon technology and um, it has a high yield and similar to reeds they have to pay out pretty much most of their cash in dividends um i think Business development companies are uh, high on a lot of people's lists lately. I've seen them being talked about quite a bit because of their high yields. I don't really know them too well or fully understand the risk behind them. So I would say check out the Dividend Bull on YouTube. He, he goes in depth in lots of these um, all the time. I watch them from time to time, but honestly, I don't understand the risks. It's funny, actually, there's a, a guy from Ireland who reached out to me this week. Um, about uh, real estate investment trusts actually and he's mentioned now that he's starting to transition from REITs and mortgage REITs into BDCs as well and he sees a, a big opportunity there so he, he, I'm going to keep in contact with this guy he's actually sent me on a lot of good information sent me on a book here and um, sent me showing me that I'm reading as well so it, it seems a popular choice at the moment nice 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 um, Lucas has asked us is it time now for REITs I cannot tell you that I don't know um, because then it's again a question about interest rates and everything and I don't know how they will further develop uh, that depends a lot on the I guess on the central bank generally speaking I've been adding this year some real estate investment trusts like like realty income I think they are offer a nice risk reward um, but whether it's now the time to say bye 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 i don't know i i have that feeling better for the insurance stocks uh, which i yeah. felt like 
yeah what what i will say is that i'm trying to educate myself in in reads particularly to because we, we all know the big ones but there's obviously some other ones out there that we maybe don't know or i don't know how to assess them and maybe overlook them so i've got a book here educated read investing by stephanie Cruson Kelly and Glenn Muller. And I have to say, I'm only two chapters in, but it's knowing you know when a book is going to be good. It's very, yeah, lots of information, but it's easy to mm. easy to digest and easy to read. So I'll, I'll keep you posted on that, but it seems like a, a good book so far. Um, Cohen has asked us, what are your thoughts about the last quarterly results of Viatris? Yeah, so here again, I studied them as well, Viatris, and I must say, Kun, it's a bit hard to grasp them. So generally, the free cash flow and everything is good. It went down compared to, uh, like, let's say, year over year, but that was to be expected. But the free cash flow numbers are still good. The company, based on that, is still very, very uh, low priced. Um, I'm not surprised that the market also responded positive to this because it's rather like in a response, like probably, oh, it's not that bad. Um, but what is hard at the moment with Fiatris, and that's why I'm keeping it a slow, uh, um, a small position, even though the the shareholder yield is really high, is the fact that they're really transitioning. So they 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 are the spin-off, of course, from GNG and such. They was it GNG or Pfizer? I forgot. Pfizer, Pfizer, maybe. Pfizer. Pfizer yeah, yeah. And um, and and effectively, you see that all those products like like Viagra, did you know that they're they are selling less Viagra? So what are people using then? Are there some alternatives? Are there other brands than Viagra, like like B labels or you know in-house brands or from from the grocery store? I don't know. <laughs> But but anyway, um, they they are really shifting their business. So it's it's kind of a portfolio management business at the moment. And uh, with that, I, I come to realize it's even more about trust and manager yeah. management that they can pull it off. And I don't know them well enough to have enough trust to make it a, a really a conviction in my portfolio. So I keep it nice, small, like where it is. It fits. Yeah. It fits well there. Yeah, what, what look what what I what I like about them is they they did come on board with a lot of debt and they they've realised that and I think they do generate a lot of cash flow, but they are focusing primarily on paying down that debt and I don't yes, think they're doing that well. Yeah, and I don't think they've raised the dividend. I think they've kept it flat this year. For, they kept it flat, I, yeah. Yeah, there. because so, they felt they could better buy back shares in that case. Exactly, exactly. But I I do like. I do like they're trying to build a good from foundation. I think they were given a little bit of a raw deal when, when they started out. What I struggle with is that the biosimilar part of the business, I thought was one of their strongest parts and they've sold that. Yeah. Um, so that was I a big disappointment for investors. Y yes, and I, I and I don't know where the growth is coming from. I, I, I don't know, I, I'm sure they have a plan. Maybe they're, go they're going to reduce down the debt to a manageable level and, and then focus on a particular area, but I don't have a clear grasp on that at the moment so yeah but, and that's the phase that they are going in now so hence my my comment like it's really a, a, you really need to trust management and you know I, I i can't i don't know them well enough yeah i think they're but they're, they're looking to like create some sort of franchise i think they acquire two companies as oyster mm -hmm. point and yeah. the other one is family life sciences um and again look i don't know a whole lot about that area and that's why i struggle to yeah to grasp where, yeah. where that's actually going so from a valuation point of view it looks so cheap they still have a decent yield of around four percent but it's just as i said it's where what will they be like in 10 years time and i don't really know the answer to that question yeah um next question is again from adrian and he asked us did you look into cebus debt restructuring do you have an opinion if they are making the right decisions here yes so this was also one of the quarterly calls that i actually dialed in and even they answered the question for me which was also funny um, but the cfo spoke to quite some extent about this and what i really liked is that they effectively they issued some shares, they bought, they paid with that off some debt um, as well. That was due, they hatched already debt. So I think we're good for a year. Um, so I've, from what I heard, I, I like what they are doing. The dividend is uh, not so safe. Uh, they are, their earnings expected are exactly the same amount as the dividend. They just got the dividend from 99 cents to 90 cents. 
um, I don't know if they are able to stick to 90 cents also for next year or whether it becomes 85 cents. Nevertheless, it, be, it stays a really high yield stock that, that I'm quite confident about. Um, but yeah, I think they're doing the right things from, from what they can. They are really, they really want to get uh, a credit rating yeah, and being investment grade. And, and that's what they're focused on. And, you know, I think they have one really one big fortune behind this is that they have such an easy, no, such a reliable clients, supermarkets. Yeah. So that that's really what, what I like here. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. you know, I'm not a depth specialist as such, but from what I saw, it all made sense. Cool. Um, Martin has asked us, I've been looking into Spirax, Sarco, um, very high quality European dividend aristocrat with a strong position in niche markets. Have you guys ever checked them out? Yeah, definitely they're part of the Noble 30 uh, index. So every year I'm looking, I'm scrolling through the investor relations page again for getting uh, the latest dividends. But you know, 37 PE is just too much for me. And 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 Marta knows me because we, we speak sometimes on Twitter and you know he's buying l'oreal and and asml all the time at prices that were he started i think at prices where they were much lower than now and i'm always sh shying away from it spirax i would love to own this company i mean it's one of i think the strongest growing companies in in the noble 30 index and and what are they doing they are doing some services and engineering around health and safety and such uh, so, I mean, can you imagine that it's growing so fast, such a company in the UK? Uh, for me, it's impressive, really impressive. Yeah, I, I briefly looked into them before, and if I recall, they are heavily into like industrial fluids and steam. Um, so it is quite a, a niche market, and they're probably the biggest, if not the only player in, in that field. So there's probably a lot of a lot of growth prospects for them. It's, it seems like it would be a hard industry to penetrate if just from just from a brief overlook outside. Yeah. Uh, definitely, I, I've seen them on your Noble Index. So they obviously an aristocrat, but that's as as far as I got with them. Good. Um, David Day has asked us. I've started looking into Siemens AG. But it seems a bit overpriced what are your thoughts about it yeah i think we spoke about it earlier i think they seem to be kind of reasonable but this is a cyclical so i'm i'm kind of confident that we will see better times ahead to buy yeah and um, caspar has asked you have invested in rio and bhp what are your take on these stocks are, these are cyclical and not dividend growth stocks uh yeah so that's why i own them uh i own them because i could get them at the time at a really high yield and but i take dividend cuts uh for granted with those companies but over time those dividends were really really juicy and they have helped me to reinvest them elsewhere at attractive prices and that's why i also can look at it right let's say uh, omega healthcare my portfolio the dividend has been flat for years i think but it spits out almost a nine to ten percent every single year so if i reinvest that i get like a nine you know the one euro becomes one euro ten becomes one euro 21 and that's how compounding works right and this is also how i look a little bit at rio and bhp and for me these these you buy also when 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 the commodities are on fire whatever when the commodities are crashing uh, like like now when you when it's talking about news by the way when it's not in the news, it's probably probably for me not a good time um, uh, to buy. Okay. Um, Salomon has asked us any thoughts about T row and positions you have. Yeah, I, I like T row, and uh, I bought some more uh, not too long ago. So um, I, their asset and the management have uh, found a floor, so it went also a little bit up again. So. The payout ratio is now on the high end, of course, uh, because of this. But you know, clean balance sheet, no debt. So, I mean, if I didn't have any stocks, I would probably uh, in Tiro, I would probably add some more. But I, you know, I don't want to buy everything in one year like a full position. I usually do it over multiple years and spread it out. Yeah, look, it's a it's a decent company, as you said. Strong balance sheet, four four and a half percent yield, give or take. 
um company that i really like as well and i think it's doing quite well i've been buying it when it dips around 100 mark um yeah. trading around 113 114 now so it's yeah doing okay um and last question of the day goes to bass Orlings, and he asked us what are your thoughts on united health group so i i've been seeing united health group already for five six years on my screen as and such i never bought it for a simple reason I don't understand why Americans are accepting to pay such high prices for their healthcare. And I don't understand how they are able to get away with it all the time. Um, I, I really don't understand how the American economy works around healthcare. So I, I just don't understand that. But for me, it feels like this is the one of the, like I said, Every time when we when, when we talk with Americans, uh, you probably have the same. You hear them complaining about their healthcare costs. Yeah, yeah. So it must be some some of the most hated companies by citizens, and and like I, I probably like tobacco stocks. I don't know. I'm not American, right? And and this company is able to grow at a really good rate. So I, I just don't understand it, and that's why I never bought it. Yeah, but if if they have no choice but to pay. Then the company has no choice but to grow. <laughs> really. Yeah, yeah. So that might be actually, actually, uh, it might be therefore that I'm declaring like this is a great business model. Yeah, yeah. But but somehow it doesn't. It makes like electrical. The wires in my head are not connected on this one. <laughs> nice. Um, okay, that was that was the last question. There was quite a few to get through. Thanks a million for all your questions. There was a couple more, I think, and um, we will save them for for next week um thanks again to european dj your thoughts and insights are always you appreciated too, my friend. and we will see you all next week remember both of us at david and talk are not certified financial specialists through formal education we are just two guys sharing our journey for inspiration and entertainment purposes hence this is not investment advice although we do our best we can't promise that the information discussed is always correct nor appropriate for you or anybody else we always recommend that you do your own due diligence and be accountable for your own choices as we always say you can't borrow conviction from others last but not least by listening to our podcast you agree to hold us harmless from any ramifications financial or otherwise that occur to you as a result of acting on information provided in this podcast <laughs>